Welcome back. My name is Bridges. Today we are going to start with the chapter number 2 of class 8 history. We have completed the history of class 6 and 7. I have already created a separate playlist for them. If you have not watched those videos, you can always go ahead and watch them. And if you have not subscribed the channel yet, then you can like and subscribe the channel and also share these initiatives to your friends and fellow aspirants. So today in this particular chapter, we will understand that how the Britishers came in India as a trader and how they control the territory of the India. So let us understand and deep dive into this chapter. So Aurangji was the last powerful Mughal ruler. So we have already understood the differentiation between that who were the, uh, the earlier Mughals and the later Mughals. So, Aurangzeb was the last powerful Mughal ruler. Why? After his death in 1770, many Mughal rulers and the governors such as the who oh, those, those were the Subedar and the big Jamidar began asserting their authority and established regional kingdoms. So we have already seen that how Awadh, then Bengal and the Hyderabad and different other factions which were controlled by the Mughal authorities, they proclaimed their uh, they asserted their authority on the particular lands which were under their control. Okay, so these powerful regional kingdoms in a, emerged in various parts of India, and Delhi could not be longer function as an effective center. So we have always understood in the previous chapters as well that whenever there is a decline of the central authority, then always these uh, other authorities which are controlling the different parts. Okay who have been given the chance to work as the Subedar or the governors, what they do, they always try to capture those particular area and they proclaim themselves as the ruler of the, those areas, okay, and gradually emerge into the power, okay, and the people do not, the people who are living in the vicinity or in that particular kingdom, they do not have any other chance apart from accepting uh, the that particular person as a king because Already they are working under that person because earlier that person might have been the governor. Now he has become the ruler. So it does not make any difference for them. However, it plays a significant role for the, if we look at the particular thing in terms of the continent or in terms of the particular area, then this plays an important role. Okay. So here an image has been depicted that Bahadur Shah has been captured and his son also has been captured, captured by the caption, Captain Hudson. Okay, so this happened after the uh, 1857 revolution. So we will look at uh, this particular uh, chapter of 1857 revolution that how this broke out and how in the particular developments took place in the different regions of the Indian subcontinent. But before that, we will need to understand the basic terms that how gradually the British came to the India and had, they captured the different part and they took the advantage of the big politic, politics or the big political uh, ruling classes of the India. Okay. So let us begin with the history of the Britishers. So East India Company comes East. How they came to the India? In 1600. The East India Company acquired a charter from the ruler of England, Queen Elizabeth. So remember this particular fact. It is really important because a straightforward question can be asked that in which year this particular char uh, charter was given and who gave this charter. So it was given by the Queen Elizabeth in 1600. Remember this. Okay. So granting it the sole right to the trade with the East. So, if a particular person or a particular uh, company has been given right, specific right to do the business in the East, then there was no threat that the another company is going to harass them or there will be any competition among these companies. However, before Britishers came to the India, there were already the Portuguese who were, who have come before the uh, Britishers. Okay, so we will understand that as well that how in the later part as well the different companies who were coming from the different parts of the European uh, territories that how they were fighting uh, amongst them and for this particular piece of land which was united 
in the different time period from the ancient to the uh, medieval and how this particular uh, subcontinent disintegrated in the modern times okay so let us understand this means that there was no trading group in the england and there was no one to compete with the east india company so it was almost like a monopoly for them okay so mercantile trading companies in those days made profit primarily by excluding the competition so they could buy cheap and sell dear so here sell dear means something which is costly so what they were doing so this particular term remember this so these terms can also appear in the economics as well whenever there is a term such as they were selling dear it means they were selling it as higher cost rather than which they purchase at the lower cost and selling at the higher cost so of course a cost which is always higher will provide them profit so it is dear to the these particular merchants okay hence this term has been used so we have already understood the mercantile at the left hand uh, in the box let us understand though that a business enterprise that makes profit primarily through trade buying goods cheap and selling them at higher prices so of course if any organization if they are able to acquire the cheap raw material and they are able to process and sell it on the higher price then of course they are going to make money okay so for uh, britishers india was that particular place where they could find the cheap labor and all the raw materials and how they will gradually convert this particular land in the their market okay so how earlier they used to bring the bullions and they used to purchase these things but after the battle uh, the battle of buxar how this particular uh, dynamics will change we will understand that so move ahead the portuguese had already established their presence in the western quarter coast of india and their base in goa so portuguese we have already understood that vasco da gama came in 1498 in india okay and after that uh, several portuguese and uh, in the different part of india but their base was the goa they established okay and they started controlling not only the western part but also the uh, the indian waters okay so we will understand this uh, blue water policy of the portuguese later on when we will be understanding about the that how they came into the india and how they influenced the different part of the indian uh, rulers okay and how they were trading and what type of uh, their uh, trading uh, method was was it uh, better than the britishers or was it uh, worse than them as well okay so vasco da gama a portuguese explorer who had discovered the sea route uh, in, in india in 1498 and dutch too were exploring so of course if uh, europe the people or the different companies or different parts of the europe when they came to know that uh, they they have already uh, found the sea route to the india and uh, the portuguese are making a huge profit after purchasing the goods from india then of course they wanted to have this particular part or share out of this particular trade so they also started exploring and one of the example is dutch later on french also came okay so the fine why india was famous the fine quality of cotton and silk produced in india and had a big market uh, in euro paper cloth cardamom cinnamon two were in great demand so why it was happening because when uh, you will understand the history of the europe as well then you will understand that uh, europe also got the renaissance and after the period of renaissance it got developed and there was the prosperity in terms of the agriculture and hence they were able to uh, cater more cattle as well so they were also processing uh, in huge number uh, the they were butchering the all these cattle so to protect the raw meat they needed these spices so and in india the pepper is really important in terms of preserving the meat so india was the main place and apart from india malaysia and the indonesia the southeast uh, asia the, this particular region is really important in terms of uh, selling the spices hence this route and the india in terms became really important 
okay so understand that that why all these type of things are happening and why these type of trades getting developed that the people were risking their life and they were trying to come all uh, the way from uh, europe to india okay because of the prosperity because of the trade they wanted to make huge profit they were prosper they wanted to save the uh, the the raw meat and the other things they wanted to uh, do the trade with the different parts of the world okay they wanted to acquire the cheap uh, labor along with the uh, the cotton which they were getting from the not only from the bengal also from the western part of india remember this so the urges to secure the market therefore led to the fierce battle between the trading companies through the 17th and 18th century they regularly sank each other's ship blocked routes and prevented rival ships from moving the supplies it is very basic whenever there is profit the the person or a particular company always want to have the uh, monopoly on that particular trade hence they were fighting with each other so this is the simply in if we understood in the simple manner then this is the meaning of that particular paragraph so to effort to fortify the settlements and carry on the profitable trade also led to the intense conflict with the local rulers as well so also we will understand that how uh, the conflict in 1757 uh, which uh, we call in the bengal we call as the battle of Plas plasi that why it occurred and prior to that when the portuguese uh, came to the india that how they wanted to uh, they they acquired the permission from the the local rulers and also the britishers when they came to the india and they started fortifying the places why they were fortifying because they always had this uh, this thing in their mind that gradually they are going to make this particular continent a colony and hence they were and apart from this they were also competing with the different uh, other companies which were coming from the french portuguese okay so they always wanted to protect their interest hence they were fortifying with the dip okay so this was the primary purpose so now let us move ahead so east india company with the trading in the air bengal so now let us move ahead and understand that how it was uh, doing business in the bengal so first english factory was set up on the banks of river hugli in 1651 so remember this it is talking about the bengal first factory in bengal it is not talking about the when they established in the indian subcontinent rather it is talking about the bengal okay so they established in 1651 at the banks of river hugli remember this okay this was the base from which the company's traders known at that time factors so we have already seen that there was a person or a factor who was recording the data in the time of that how masuli patnam or the machli patnam uh, it was in the room so we have already seen in the previous chapters so they were also known as the factors the factory had a warehouse where the goods for export were stored and it had office where the company official sat so sometimes these questions also being asked that what was the purpose of these factories which have which were established by the different uh, companies who came to the india so it was the purpose was they had warehouse where the goods can be stored for the export purposes and apart from this it was also used as the office okay where the officials used to set so by 1696 it began to building a fort around the settlement Two years later, it uh, bribed Mughal officials into giving the company Javidari rights over three villages. So, which were the three villages? One of these was the Calicutta, other two was the Sutinati and Govindgarh. Okay. So, hence they control they for acquiring the Javidari rights of these three villages. What they did? They were the expert in giving the what? They were expert in bribing the people. They bribed the Mughal officials and got the permission. Okay. So one, what happened that once they have established their toehold, they also persuaded the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb to issue a farman granting the company to the right to the duty free. So they also acquired the duty free right. Okay. And what is the farman? Farman is a royal addict a royal order 
so they were very shrewd and they were very cunning in their purpose they were very much clear that how they gradually will do all these things and will acquire the different parts where they can make the huge profits now they once they have got the permission to do the uh, duty free right uh, duty free trading in this particular area so how they started exploiting it so let us understand this particular paragraph here i am talking about this particular paragraph so the company tried to continuously press more consensus and manipulated the existing privilege orange s sarman for instance has granted only company to the right to trade duty free okay this particular farman gave the permission to the company only but what was happening the officials of the company who were carrying on the private trade on the side they were expected to pay the duty they refused to pay and causing an enormous loss to the revenue of bengal so understand for an example if an organization which have taken the permission okay to do the trade in a particular region but if the permission has been given to that particular company rather apart from this particular company the people who are working in that particular company if they start to doing the private trade also they also started exploiting it exploiting it okay so now what was happening that apart from company all those people who were belonging to uh, the company and they were indulged into the private trade they also stopped paying the taxes now the taxes have been stopped so ultimately it is going to a uh, cause it is going to cause the exchequer or in this case was the ruler so hence they they were not paying the taxes to the ruler now it was a loss for the this particular kingdom or the ruler understood so this was happening so they started exploiting it so after the death of aurangzeb the bengal nawab asserted their powers and autonomy so murshid ali khan was followed by the aliwar di khan and siraj uddola as the nawab of the bengal so understand that in ishar murshid ali kuli khan was there it was followed by the aliwar di khan and then became the siraj uddola as the nawab of bengal at the left hand side here we are uh, it is the image of robert clive that how robert clive played an important role in the history of uh, the british empire we will understand so let us move ahead and understand this particular story that each one of them were the strong ruler all these murshid kuli ali wardi khan siraj uddola so they refused to grant the a company the consensus and demanded large tribute of the company's right to trade denied it to the right to mint coins and stopped it from extending its fortification so now understand now when it comes to the the reign of siraj uddola and now siraj uddola is ruling in 1756 as a nawab of bengal now what was happen that what was happening that siraj has already refused that he refused to grant the company the concession apart from also demanded a large tribute for the company's right to trade because he wanted to protect the rights or he wanted to protect the business of the person or the people who were trading in the Uh, that particular kingdom for an example if there was there is a particular additions and he is selling something uh, at the price of 10 anna or 15 anna what happens that these uh, britishers used to do that and that additions also used to pay the taxes but what they were doing they came and rather than uh, selling it 10 or 15 annas what they used to do they procured this particular uh, things from these artisans at very cheap cost and they used to sell it or they used to sell uh, send it to the england without paying the taxes and they used to acquire it at very cheap rate okay hence they were not paying the taxes and avoiding the taxes so and it also created a huge problem for the these artisans as well okay so now what was happening the they were also minting the coins so siraj also denied that do not mint the coin and also stopped them from the fortification because there was an apprehension that these people are not good and they may be they may create a problem for the the rule or the particular kingdom 
So now what was happening that accusing the company of deceit, they claimed that the company was depriving the Bengal government huge amount of revenue and under undermining the authority of the Nawab. So we have already understood that what type of things these Britishers was trying to do and refused to pay the taxes. And also what they started doing, writing started writing the disrespectful red letters and trying to humiliate the Nawab and his officials. So Nawab got really angered on all these things and he was really infuriated because of all these acts which was happening because he has already provided the clear cut instructions that uh, please do not do all these things which he had already denied but still they were doing it. So conflict led to the confrontation and finally culminated in the famous battle of Plassey. That how the battle of Plassey changed the mood of India we will see just a minute. Now move ahead and at the left hand side it has provided some information about the puppet. So we are already understand that what the puppet means. A toy that you can move with the string or a term used for the disapproving to refer to the person who is controlled by someone else. Okay. So now let us focus on the battle of Plassey. Why it is important? And remember the date. When Ali Wardi Khan died in 1756 and Shiraj Uddala became the Nawab of Bengal. Okay, what company always wanted? Company always wanted to get the profit, so they were keen to set a puppet ruler on the Gaddi or okay on the throne. But what was happening? Because uh, Siraj already understood uh, that how cunning they were and they could be a threat for the, uh, the this particular region of Bengal. So Siraj asked the company to stop meddling in the political affair of the his dominion and stop the fortification and pay the revenues but all these negotiations failed okay so what siraj did siraj moved with the 30000 soldiers and uh, he acquired the english like and what he did he captured the company officials and captured the factory of kasim bazar of the english okay and locked the warehouse so they summed the Englishmen and blocked the English ships and then he marched to the Kolkata and established the control over the company's fort there. Okay, so all these things were happening and this when what was happening that when he locked these Englishmen in the warehouse, so there few people also died. Okay, so it is also called as the Black Hall tragedy. On the hearing of this particular news, the, the fall of the Kolkata, what company officials in Madras, uh, what they did, they must have sent uh, some information to the officials in the Madras and what the uh, officials in the Madras did, they sent the force under the command of Robert Clive to reinforce by the naval fleets. So there were the prolonged negotiations with the Nawab followed. So what type of negotiations this uh, Robert Clive was doing. Robert Clive was very, very cunning, very clever in his approach and very sharp. And he understood uh, the particular, uh, the polity and he took his time in terms of negotiation. He just uh, did this type of uh, thing that he is negotiating with the Nawab. Meanwhile, he what he did that he colluded with the people who were the very uh, loyal to the Nawab. However, they had their aspirations to become the Nawab such as Mir Jafar and the Jagat Seth and all these people who were there who were earlier shows as the they were the supporter of the Nawab however what Robert Clive did that uh, he colluded with all these people and it was it, it was never a battle it was just a mere skirmish after buying all this time he got what he wanted and how this particular uh, battle converted let us see that as well so robert clyde led the company's army against the sirajuddala at plassey okay so and defeated the nawab of course it was to happen because he has already uh, these people such as mira uh, uh, mir jafar okay and the jagat Seth and the other people in the army they never fought it was simply they colluded and hence siraj has got the defeat there were two or three people they fought from the behalf of uh, Siraj, but it was not sufficient to defeat the English people. Okay, so Clive had managed to secure his support by promising him Nawab after crushing the Siraj Uddala. So uh, after capturing Siraj, he was executed. He was killed okay, on the battlefield. The Battle of Plassey became famous because it was the first major victory of the company won in India. 
though they were indulged in the several other uh, battles in the different parts of the india but this was the major victory because bengal was a prosperous state and when they defeated uh, siraj uddaula it was a really big achievement because most of the 80% of trade of that time in india was happening from the bengal itself and uh, the chalikos and the the uh, the cotton materials and the jute related uh, uh, art and artifacts all these things which were uh, was getting developed were happening in the uh, the part of the bengal itself understood so it was a really big victory for robert clive so siraj ud-dawla was assass- uh, assassinated and mir jafar was made the nawab the company was still unwilling to take the uh, responsibility of the administration because they were merely interested in capturing the wealth of india they were never interested in the ruling the class or making any changes in the life of the people okay soon the company discovered that this was rather difficult for even the puppet nawabs were not always helpful because they had their aspirations such as mir jafar okay mir jafar protested and the company deposed him he was removed and installed mir qasim in his place so it was the game for them that it was already always happening in the different parts as well when we will move ahead and we will see that how the different rulers were getting deposed by them and they were installing the different people who were agreeing on the terms of the britishers so they were always in the favor of making the these people the kings and the rajas okay so when the mir qasim complained he term uh, was defeated in the battle fought at the baksar in 1764 so again there was a war after 7 years so in this particular war mir qasim and other two rulers as well so we will see when we will understand in the detail then we will see that how this particular uh, war took place and it is called as the battle of waxer that why it was important we will understand in the subsequent paragraph so he was defeated and the driven out of bengal and mir jafar was once again reinstalled okay and they got the huge war indemnity how the rs 5 lakh every month was imposed as the company to pay uh, money to these company okay as the to finance the wars and the war indemnity was also applied to them okay by the time mir jafar died in 1765 the mood of the company had changed how having failed to work with the puppet nawabs clyde declared so remember this particular date so we have already discussed three different dates and two important wars first war 1757 it was battle of plassey and 1764 battle of baksar and now what in 1765 what uh, clive is going to say clive proclaimed that we must indeed become the nawab of ourselves why in 1765 mughal emperor appointed the company as the diwan of the province of bengal so understand whenever a person has got the diwan become the diwan so it so it has controlled the finances of that particular province or that particular area so now having the uh, diwani rights okay of the bengal so diwani right in that time bengal included not only particular bengal but the assam and bihar as well so it was not a smaller state or we say the province it was huge province okay and making a humongous amount of uh, money they were making out of the trade okay and the different uh, businesses which were or the trade activities which were happening in the different part of that area so understood that now they were the britishers were the self sufficient they did not need any amount to bring from the uh, london to make any trade related activities rather the, this particular stage was sufficient to finance their expenses their wars their uh, purchasing powers so the diwani allowed the company to use the vast revenue resources of bengal and solve the major problem that company had earlier faced what type of problem earlier they were by they were getting the money or the bullions which means the gold and the silver okay in exchange of that they were getting the raw materials from india but now this problem was solved because they got the the power now understand that india's money will finance the raw material for britishers and after processing this raw material they will send this particular uh, processed material to indians as well so they were making money by the way any which ways and exploiting india uh, in all senses 
because they never took the responsibility of uh, ruling or they denied the administration rather they were happy in taking the diwani rights because it was creating uh, money for them okay so this was because that they had no goods to sell in india the outflow of gold from the britain slowed after the battle of plassey and entirely stopped after the assumption of diwani now revenue from india could finance the company's expenses these revenue could be used to purchase the cotton silk textile in india and maintain company's troops they got the free hand and they could meet the the building and the company port and offices at the calcutta so all these things were happening so now how the company official became nabobs so what this term nabobs so when they were not able to pronounce it correctly so they used to call it as instead of nawabs they used to call it as the nabobs but the britishers those people uh, who were there in the london or in the britain they used to uh, in the very light manner or uh, to make the fun of these people who were serving the british india company they used to call them as the nabobs after the battle of plassey the actual nabobs of bengal were forced to give the land and vast sums of money as personal gift to company officials robert clive when he was appointed the governor of bengal in 1764 so remember this fact that when he was appointed he was appointed in 1764 he was asked to remove the corruption in company administration but was himself cross examined in 1772 by british parliament which was suspicious of his vast wealth and although he acquitted he committed suicide in 1774 okay so important part for us is that robert clive appointed as the governor of bengal in 1764 okay now the company's rule that how it expanded so company rarely launched a direct military attack on unknown territory so understand this particular characteristic of uh, britishers and this that how this gradually change in their attitude when they become they will uh, acquire the vast territory of india then it will also bring the change in their attitude later on initially they are they are saving themselves uh, from any direct military attack on any unknown territory instead they use the variety of politics economic and di diplomatic methods to extend their influences before annexing any kingdom so after the battle of baksar in 1764 what they did they appointed resident in the indian state so who were these residents so these residents were the people or the the person who were working with the company and they were appointed and they were the eyes and the ear of the company and they used to provide all the information about that particular state that how or whether uh, the king or the nawab is taking the decision in the favor of the britishers or not if they are not taking the decision in the favor of the britishers then they used to uh, rather used to attack or they used to clear cut uh, give them some uh, sort of warning that this is not go not good and you will have to pay the prices for this okay so they were installed so sometimes the company forced the states into subsidiary alliance so we will see that what type of arrangement was this according so it is important and so it was the brand child of uh, wellesley so we will understand that what type of characteristics or what was the purpose of subsidiary alliance so let us understand according to the term of alliance Indian rulers were not allowed to have their independent armed forces they were to be protected by the company so first thing indian rulers were not allowed to have their own army okay and had to pay the subsidiary forces all those forces which provided by the britishers okay they were have to be paid by the ruler who is uh, getting the services of these britishers remember this okay so they were weakening the state and they were uh, providing their own soldiers okay and they were also getting paid and if they were not able to pay then what was happening let us move ahead and see if indian ruler failed to make the payment then the part of their territory was taken so now they were acquiring the territory in exchange of what in exchange of services if they were not able to pay then they were acquiring the territory itself okay and particular area 
so as a palanty so richard wellesley was the governor general of seven, from 1798 to 1805 so he it was this particular uh, this particular settlement or we can say the arrangement was the brainchild of the richard wellesley okay so nawab of awadh was forced to give the half of his territory uh, to the company in 1801 and when he failed to pay the subsidiary forces hyderabad was also forced to cede the territory on the similar ground so these were the states such as awadh the hyderabad okay so move ahead now let us talk about the tipu sultan the tiger of mysore so why he was called the tiger of mysore so we will understand so company is resorted to the direct military confrontation when it saw threat to its political and economical interest by that time when it was happening somewhere around 1782 and after that so they they had established a good to hold in india okay and they were very much confident so now they whenever there was a question related to their uh, political or economical interest they used to do the direct attacks so they had the threat from tipu sultan and his father hyder ali that why was uh, they they were threat to these britishers let us understand so mysore had grown in the strength under the leadership of powerful rulers like hyder ali who ruled from 1761 to 82 and his famous son tipu sultan who ruled from 1782 to 1799 remember this so mysore controlled the profitable trade at the malabar coast okay where is malabar coast malabar coast is the part of the kerala okay so in 1785 tipu sultan stopped the export of sandalwood pepper and cardamom through the ports of his kingdom and disallowed the local merchant from trading with the company so he instructed the local traders that do not trade with the britishers why because he and his father had a good relation with the french so they had the close ties with the french hence uh, and there was a very bad relation between the french and the english okay so they were in continuous tussle so hence the britishers always wanted to remove uh, hyder ali and, and the tipu sultan so let us move ahead and understand the uh, that what was what type of development then happening so how the french were helping helping the uh, british uh, these uh, tipu sultan and his father they were helping in the modernization his army and with the different type of other things like providing the latest uh, weapon and the the training to the uh, soldiers of the mysore okay so the british were furious and they saw hyder and tipu as ambitious arrogant and dangerous ruler who had to be controlled and crushed four wars were fought with the mysore so these four wars were well, happened in 1767 to 69 then 1780 to 84 1790 to 92 and 1799 so remember these timelines okay 67 to 69 80 to 84 90 to 92 okay and then final battle in 1799 so the battle of seringapatna or seringapatna did the company ultimately win the victory and it was 1799 Tipu Sultan was killed defending his capital Seringapatna Mysore was placed under the former ruling dynasty Wadiars so earlier Wadiars were the ruler and after winning this particular territory okay so this uh, particular rule was given back to the Wadiars and they were made the subsidiary they were bring into the subsidiary alliance okay so here an interesting uh, information has been provided at the right hand side so let us understand that as well so cornwallis here this person cornwallis receiving the sons of the tipu sultan as the hostage okay in so this particular image was depicted in 1792 so in 1790 uh, to attack by the combined forces of the marathas nizam of hyderabad and the company tipu was forced to sign a treaty with the british by which two of his sons were taken as the hostage so here we are seeing that how the different powers marathas hyderabad the nizam of, of hyderabad and the other uh, and the company all these uh, coming to the together attacking the tipu sultan so why it was happening 
we will understand that part as well then when we will uh, look at the uh, different understanding or different treaties of the marathas with the uh, british okay so how they came into the alliance and how they were persuaded to attack the tipu sultan okay so let us move ahead so it has provided us some interesting information here a toy has been depicted that how a tiger is killing a, a sepoy so this toy of tiger is now kept in the victoria and albert museum in london uh, when tipu was killed they this toy particular toy was taken okay to the london and where it was placed so a particular story has been provided but it is of uh, it will serve no purpose to us so we will understand the important thing so war with the marathas so we are understanding the important fact and factors which has been provided so which will provide us the uh, the basis of the modern india okay so it has provided just the glimpse of the different uh, type of uh, the things which was happening in the different part of uh, from bengal to the southern most tip of the india and how the different rulers were being uh, part of the different alliances with the britishers so just understand them one by one and as we will move ahead you will get the more information and you would be able to connect all these dots one by one hence you will get the more knowledge okay so the hence i am trying to provide all this information in terms of a story so listen to it and whenever there are the important terms or the dates which you need to remember i will emphasize or will provide you you just need to mug up all those details so when you will write the mains answer as well it this particular information provide uh, an important fodder for your answers okay so with their defeat in the third battle of panipat in 1761 it is talking about the marathas so the maratha dream of ruling from delhi was shattered because before 1761 it was very much uh, prominent and it, the britishers were looking at the marathas at, as they are going to be the centralized rule after the mughals but this particular thing did not happen because they were crushed and 1761 was the year in which they had to face a very crushing defeat okay in the northwestern part so we will understand that war as well so they were divided into the many state under the different chiefs or sardar belonging to different dynasties such as sindhias holkar gaidwards bhonsles the chiefs were held together in the confederacies under peshwa okay the principal minister who became its effective military and administrative head based in pune okay so we understand that uh, peshwas started to have the control over when in terms of the ruling class of the marathas okay so maharaji sindhia and the nana fadnavis were two famous maratha soldiers soldiers so remember their name so first war ended in 1782 with the treaty of salabai so here it is talking about the marathas war with the britishers okay so first war ended in 1782 remember this particular treaty so the treaty which uh, came to the conclusion was treaty of salabai but there was no clear cut victors the second anglo maratha war happened in 1803 to 5 and this was fought on different fronts and on the different thing resulting in the britishers gaining the odisha and the territories north of the yamuna they were including the agra and delhi finally the third anglo maratha war happened in 18 said 1870 to 19 and in which maratha power was crushed okay so peshwa was removed and sent away to bithur near kanpur with the pension and the company now had the complete control over the territory south of the vindhyas okay so three battles we have discussed 1782 which ended with the conclusion of treaty of salabai then 1803 to 5 and the final battle happened in the 1870 to 90 remember this now the claim of paramountancy so what is the meaning of the paramountancy you will understand that so under the lord hastings who was the governor general from 1830 to 23 a new policy of paramountancy was initiated so remember this who initiated the the policy of paramountancy it was lord hastings so its authority was paramount whose authority company's authority was paramount or supreme hence its power was greater than the 
of Indian states in order to protect its interest, it was justified to annex or threaten to annex the Indian kingdom. So now they become so powerful. Now they were openly uh, stating the policies which were of the annexation or uh, which were to declare their paramountcy. Okay. And Lord Hastings did this. So when the British tried to annex the small state of Kittur, remember this particular paragraph, really important uh, fact has been included, which are really important and can be asked as a question in PCS or UPPCS exams. So British tried to annex a small state of Kittur in Karnataka today. Raji Rani Chanama, remember this particular name, Rani Chanama, took the arms and led the anti-British resistance movement. She was arrested in 1824 and died in the prison in 1829. Okay, so there was a person, Rayanna, a poor chokidar of Sangoli in Kuttur, carried out the resistance and he was caught and hanged by the Britishers in 1830. 30. So remember the name of Rani Chanama and the Rayana. Okay. So it is to be said that the Rani Chanama was the first lady uh, ruler who uh, proclaimed the war against the Britishers. Okay. So this fact becomes important. In the late 1830s, the East India Company became worried about the Russians. Now they imagined that the Russia might expand across the Asia and they may enter India from the northwestern part. And uh, by driving this particular fear, what they did, the Britishers now wanted to secure their control because now the Indian subcontinent giving them a huge amount of money and they never wanted to lose their control on the particular continents. Hence, they were apprehensive the attack of the Russians. So what they did, they fought a prolonged war with the Afghanistan between 1838 and 42 and established the indirect company rule and Sith was taken over in 1843. So remember this particular date, 1843 when the Sindh was annexed. So Maharaja Ranjit Singh in the history of India, he is an important figure. Okay, so Maharaja Ranjit Singh held back the company after his death in 1839. Ultimately, in 1849, Punjab was annexed. Okay, so after the death of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, he died in 1839, and 18 by the within 10 years, the there was a turmoil and uh, there was a political weakness in his rule. And after 1849, Punjab was annexed. Okay, now that doctrine of lapse. What is this? Under the Lord Dalhousie. So all these names which are important and who gave the different policies, introduced the different policies becomes important. And of course, the doctrine of labs really important. So Doc, uh, Lord Dalhousie introduced this policy, who was the governor general from 1848 to 56. Okay, just uh, before the 1857 revolt. The doctrine declared that if an individual Indian ruler died without a male heir, I have uh, already uh, highlighted this particular term male hair. So remember this in the exam. If you do not see the male hair, then the term may be wrong. Okay. But if you see the male hair, okay, then it really becomes important because this is going to make the difference. If the question asked that uh, the according to the doctrine of lapse, uh, if there was no hair, then uh, the kingdom could be lapsed. But this was not the case. If there was no male hair, in then the kingdom could be lapsed. Okay, or become the part of company's territory. Once the kingdom after another, these were the annexed. So first kingdom which was annexed on the basis of the uh, doctrine of lapse was the Satara, which was acquired or annexed in 1848. Second was the Sambalpur. It was annexed in 1850. Then Udaipur 1852. Then Nagpur in 53. Jhansi in 54. Okay, now remember this. That Avad was annexed in 1856 but it was not annexed on the behalf of doctrine labs but it was annexed on the basis of the misgovernance remember this this is the basic difference and most of the time straightforward question is being asked on this particular term that whether Avad was annexed on the doctrine of labs or misgovernance so remember this it was annexed on the basis of misgovernance 
okay so the people of avadh joined the great revolt of that broken 1857 so it was the one of the reasons of the breakout of the uh, the this particular revolt of 1857 remember that so here in this particular image you will see that how gradually the britishers acquired the territories and how they are uh, they annexed the uh, they took control of the india entire indian subcontinent here all these yellow portions were initial under the control of the britishers but later on gradually they started to acquire the uh, the all other areas in 1796 they acquired very small areas and by 1840 within the 43 years they controlled huge chunk of the part and by 1857 they almost control the entire indian subcontinent okay setting up of the new administration so warren hastings the governor general who was uh, the governor general from 1773 to 5085 okay so he was the important figure and the significant role uh, played in the expansion of the company's power and acquired the power not only in Bengal but also in the Bombay and Madras. Okay, so territories were broadly divided in the administration units called as the presidency. So whenever you heard the term uh, presidency, it was the administration administrative term used by the Britishers. Okay, so there was three presidencies: Bengal, Madras, and the Bombay Presidency. Bengal, Madras, and the Bombay Presidency. Remember, it's, each was ruled by the governor. So all these three uh, presidencies had the governors. The supreme head of the administration was the governor general. So this governor used to report to the governor general. And Warren Hastings was the first governor general. So remember this. Warren Hastings became the first governor general. Okay. At the right hand side, few information has been provided such as Kaji was a judge, Mufti was a jurist of the Muslim community responsible for expounding the law that Kaji would administer. Okay. Then let us move ahead and from 1772, a new system of justice was established. Each district was to have two courts, one criminal courts called as the Fawz Dari Adalat and second was the civil court called as the Diwani Adalat. So Malvis and Hindu Pandits interpreted the Indian laws for the European and the district collector who presided over the civil courts. So remember this, there was Fawz Dari Adalat called as the criminal court and civil court as the Diwani Adalat. Okay. And who used to preside it? The collector used to preside it. The criminal court were still under the Kajis and Muftis but under the supervision of collector okay so they were ruled on the dharma shastras and to bring about the uniformity in 1775 11 pandits were asked to compile a digest of hindu laws a book compiled book okay of hindi laws uh, and b hal had translated this digest into english okay so who was the person who translated this digest into English, it was N. B. Hallhead. Remember this, and it was done in 1775. Okay, so 1778, a code of Muslim law was also compiled for the benefit of European judge. The Regulating Act of 1773. So remember this particular act, Regulating Act of 1773. A new Supreme Court was established. When it was established, 1773 because of the regulating, regulating act. While a court of appeal was also established, the Sadr Nizamat Adalat also set up at Calcutta. So remember, two things happened because of the regulating act of 1773, Supreme Court was established okay, in Calcutta and the court of appeal, the Sadr Nizamat Adalat was also set up at Calcutta. Now the company's army, the Mughal army was mainly composed of cavalry, the Sawars trained and soldier on the horseback infantry that is paddle foot. The East India Company adopted the same method when it began to recruitment for its own army and which came to be known as the Sepoy army from the Indian word Sepahi meaning soldiers. So of course we understand that uh, English has taken the words from Hindi as well because 
uh, for a longer period of time india was the colony for the britishers and a lot of words which were hindi directly took from the hindi vocabulary and became the part of the english okay so sepahi because they had problem in pronouncing the sepahi so they used to call it as the sepoy so they uh, used to call it the sepoy okay in the early 19th century the british began to develop the uniform military culture and subjected to the european style of training drilling discipline and they regulated their life far more than they before okay so now as now it is concluding that by 1857 the company came to exercise the direct rule over 863% of the territory and 78% of the population of indian subcontinent so this fact becomes important whenever you are writing any essay or are writing any answers okay of gs1 then these terms you can use okay so by 1857 they made the huge change 63% of the territory and 78% of the population was directly controlled by the britishers so we have looked at the different portions of the modern india that how these uh, companies along with the british india company or east india company which came to the india and started ruling the different part initially they came as the traders and how gradually they developed and became the ruler of the india okay and we have seen the different uh, wars and how they also tried to make the different changes and the different policies such as the and the doctrine of paramount see these dates and we have talked about the the uh, the battle of plassey battle of buxar so remember these dates and the important facts and the figures the name okay and who was the first governor general all these become be really important for the examination purpose though i have tried to uh, tell you in terms of the story and uh, whenever there was important terms i have highlighted and i have emphasized enough okay so you just need to note down and mug up all these facts okay and i will see you in the next chapter till then jai hind